This is Radio File with Chad Dukes. It's Radio File with Chad Dukes. Very excited. I have listened to this gentleman for many years. I remember working at the Home Depot in Fairfax, Virginia, and I would get off work after closing and flip on my radio while playing my PlayStation 1 and listen to Pharrell on the bench with Mr. Scott Pharrell, who joins me now on the Mattress Warehouse Hotline. Scotty, huge props to you for coming on the program. Thank you so much for making time this week. How you doing, bud? I'm cool, man. I think I when I went to Fairfax to do the show at JFK once, I got weed at that Home Depot parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> you might have bought it from some people that worked in the plumbing department with me because that seemed to be something I believe it. that was a popular destination. Well, uh, Scotty, of course, you are – on the sports grid, Pharrell Coast to Coast, it is uh, right. a weekly show. You got your gam- – nobody throws cash like you, Pharrellonthebench.com. And I, I got to say, man, I'm a huge fan of what you do on the air, but I'm also a huge fan. You take risks, and you go places that are unestablished, and you establish them, and you find success in places that a lot of people scratch their heads about. Satellite, terrestrial, uh, television, play-by-play. Your career, how would you even write a book about all the different gigs you've had in your career? Or how many people that I pissed off or offended? Uh, <laughs> I guess that would be uh, pretty easy to do. i got a, a line going around the block with people that don't like me. And I guess the suit side of things and the business side of things and radio. But I, I think all that's kind of overblown and overrated. You know, as many people as uh, there are out there that may not like my uh, act or style or the way I've handled things. There's uh, a, a list of people that do like it, you know, like, you know, when I worked for Chris Olivero at CBS, I, you know, you have to understand he was my producer at WNEW New York Morning Drive. So wow. he was like a full-time narc then, like he was on the take <laughs> for the suits then, like everything I did. Uh, he would tell him like so i would come in strung out hung over drunk high whatever and he would just go right and tell him and then the funny thing is though is that the guy that was his boss at the time the highest guy he already knew all that stuff <laughs> so he, he already knew that i was uh, a bad seed and that and he was probably out drinking with me till three in the morning and then like it's so funny like one guy's narking i mean the other guy's out doing it with me so uh you know chris ended up being powerful and running CBS radio, let's say Saks, and, uh, you know, uh, he was working for Dan Mason. He was his right-hand man. And so those guys liked me, and, you know, they brought me back there from uh, when I was with Howard Stern at, at Sirius and doing Howard 101. They brought me back, and I don't think anyone in the business uh, would have ever thought that would happen because uh, I had, as they say, the bridges of Navarone, I had blown up every bridge. And, like, look, I never did my show to please uh, program directors, to be honest with you. I did it for uh, audience and fans and people and sports fans. And, uh, you know, at a time when I started, uh, I was going after the 18 to 34. I was going after young uh, surfers, skateboarders, potheads, drunks, (laughs) freaks, uh, sex fiends, uh, you know, uh, people smoking hot chicks and G-strings. I was looking to have a tailgate party every day of my life. Like MTV hired me to host the summer house, uh, to do rock and jock, uh, to do, you know, everything crazy. I had long hair. Uh, I was wild. I was uh, high. I was uh, willing to jump off buildings. I was willing to uh, jump off, uh, you know, uh, the piers into the ocean doing flips. I was willing to hurt myself. Uh, long before, you know, jackass and stuff like that, I was doing that stuff and setting fires and, you know, doing everything crazy. And it was all to, you know, garner to the young people. Like I wasn't interested in what, you know, really, uh, you know, whatever you call it, uh, 25, 54, you know, the older set, whatever it is, uh, now that I'm old, uh, I can look back and say, I was going after young people. I wasn't so like, uh, like imagine me like trying to please a bunch of suits that were critical of me or pulling me into their office for a meeting about my behavior. Uh, I used to, I remember I was in San Francisco for this guy, Bob Agnew, and he'd look at me like I was insane. I'm like, I am insane. (laughs) 
<laughs> you fucking idiot. Like, I'm not listening to you. I'm not listening to you. Ever. Like, I'm going to leave here right now and smoke a fat doobie the size of Texas uh, so I can get over this meeting. So I can, like, just... It's like taking a cable. I want to go bust off a cable after meeting with you because all your stupid rules. It's so funny to me, like people, and no offense to him, really, honestly. Like, he's just an example of a guy that was, like, trying to change me. And, you know, he's a big radio guy, whatever. He's had a lot of success. He ran KBR. It was huge. It was successful. But, um, you know, it's funny. He hired me. He gave me all this money to come out there and work there. And then the minute I got there, he started trying to change me. Like, are you kidding? Like, you knew what you were getting. And then you want to make it something else like all the rest of your candy-ass shows? Uh, you want me to be just like everybody else out here with your Napa Valley wine-tasting crowd? It's not happening, dude. And then what happened? I was number one there for a year, every single book. And then I was on Sports Channel America, nationally syndicated, uh, the TV show and radio show at the same time. It was gigantic. And then he was mad that I had that success. So the minute I could tell he was upset with everything I did, uh, Mel Carmison came along and said, how'd you like to be syndicated in 250 markets with uh, all of Howard Stern's channels, uh, stations and stuff? I was like, let's go. And it was over. And I left. And I went to L.A. and did it from there. And basically from there, Chad, I was on uh, really the CBS Infinity Westwood One surfboard for the rest of my career. Let's face it. I did like uh, the 90s out there. And then, um, you know, and I'm on all these great stations with Howard, like KLSX in Los Angeles. Are you kidding me? I was on JFK, right? I was on yeah. WFA in New York. And so, uh, and then when I, you know, left, uh, eventually I went on Letterman and I announced that I was leaving to go do hockey play-by-play for the Thrashers in their expansion season in 99. Everyone said I was stupid and I was, I must be nuts. Who walks away from that kind of money to make no money? And I said, uh, I like hockey more than I like money, and I like hockey way more than I like any of you people. So just so you know, you're all a bunch of dickheads. And, like, I like David Letterman. I love him, but you're all a bunch of pussies. So uh, suck my dick. How's that sound? Suck a big, fat dick. Suck a big, fat dick. And then I left and did that. And then I did that for a year, and I hated it. I mean, I you know, I didn't understand the grind. I didn't understand the buses and the sure. uh, plane rides and the suits and the, I mean, wearing a suit, right? And then having uh, to eat the same food every day, the same time, the same meals, the same faces. All they do is talk hockey 24-7. They never talk about anything else. I'm like, can we talk about some pussy or something? Uh, can we can we watch a porno? Would that be all right? Because this sucks. Like, I don't care about your power play, okay? Uh, your, or your morning skate or your uh, lower body injury, okay? So uh, they said at the end, what do you want to do? I said, I want to go home. They said, we want you to go home, too. I said, good, pay me for three years because they owed me for four years, guaranteed. Best deal I ever cut with Turner Sports and, uh, you know, uh, Ted Turner and uh, the Schiller family, uh, Harvey Schiller, Derek runs the Braves now. I said, uh, you know, four years, guaranteed, and I did one year. So every two weeks for four years, I got a paycheck in the mail. It was the greatest gig I ever had. I I never worked. I never did anything. So uh, I never missed a game, never missed a goal. I drank beer in the press box. That upset everybody. Uh, I, I had to drink to watch them play. They won 11 games the whole fucking year. So I had a drink. Drinking was just the beginning of it. I was out in a parking lot smoking bowls before I went and did it because they were so bad. But uh, eventually CBS brought me back, right, from the dead. Uh, I did sports fan for a while in Vegas. I lived in uh, Mandalay Bay, which was also a debauchery central let me just explain what that was about. It was about drinking and hookers, okay? <laughs> so that was just absolutely kick-ass. I never paid for anything, and I had just absolute ass all over me every day. Free ass. It was the greatest thing ever. And then uh, I eventually <laughs> eventually CBS said, come back to New York or uh, no. You know, it's either New York or, or bust. So I moved to New York, and then I was there basically – uh, you know, ever since I, I went to Miami one year when I got fired at NEW because they had the sex for Sam scandal. And that was uh, Opie and Anthony. And they convinced the guy to bang his wife in the St. Patrick's Cathedral on the day of atonement with 200 parishioners praying to God, which was just an absolutely titties move. It was so uh, funny and it was so kick ass that like, I, I mean, the whole thing gave me wood, right? I was like, that is funny shit. 
And then they fired everyone. And I go, that's not funny. And no. then they called me up and said, you're fired. I said, what did I do? They said, you know him. I was like, okay. <laughs> so I moved to Boca because I, I had a condo. And I ended up working at QAM Miami and doing morning drive. I got fired there for saying Howard David's wife had a dank box. And uh, the FCC sued me, swinging a mess they lost. Uh, I was found not guilty. They couldn't prove what dank box was, uh, which was awesome. Uh, and then I ended up going back to New York, and uh, and I guess I did uh, man cow for a little while, but I ended up going back to New York, and then uh, they put me on the fan, and then I did ESPN radio. I left the fan to do ESPN radio full time. Chernoff was mad at me. He's like, I brought you back here, and you screw me. I'm like, oh, is that how you see it? Because in Portuguese, what I saw is I was working Saturday nights. Meanwhile, I've been syndicated my whole career in 250 uh, cities. But now I'm doing Saturday nights on the fan for three hours, and, and, and you're doing me a favor. I go, watch this. So ESPN gave me full time, you know, seven to midnight, five nights a week. And I took them uh, from a brand new station with no listeners, zero audience from day one. And I brought them to a two share. They never got a two share again until <laughs> Michael K finally beat Francesa. They never had ratings until K show won. So I got them ratings, and they wouldn't give me a contract. So I went back to, um, you know, uh, I guess eventually Howard Stern hired me, and I, I ended up going to um, work for Howard, which was the best thing that ever happened to me in my life. Right. And then when that when I did, you know, whatever it was, seven years there, I could see the writing on the wall that they wanted to change me, uh, to, like move me to another channel. They, I think Howard wanted to make the channels all about him 100%. Uh, every day, all Howard, all day, every day. And I could tell it was coming, right? I could see the writing on the wall because they, like, asked me to go to lunch with Russo. And I was like, why would I go to lunch with that pussy? Honestly, I I'm like, but at the time, like, those guys hated me, Mike and the Mad Dog. So why would I be nice to some guy that hates me, right? So, uh, but eventually, because I worked for Howard, he respected me because right. he knew I wasn't a dick. And we eventually became cool and friendly and we could uh, be around each other, no problem. And I liked him, and I was getting along with him. But I didn't want to work for him and, uh, and listen to him. You know what I mean? Sure. So uh, when they started doing that to me, I made a call to Chris Alvaro, and I said, why don't you send the k Pharrell on events again? And lucky for me, they started CBS Sports Radio Network, and they put me on at 10 to midnight or 10 to 2. And uh, I gave them seven years. When I went back there, uh, Chad, I don't think anyone thought I could do it because I was doing, like, radio – uh, the filthiest, dirtiest, most repulsive, disgusting, like unearthly radio show ever. And it was titties. It was so awesome. It was so kick ass. <laughs> and they said I couldn't do clean radio. So I gave them the Vatican radio network and I did it clean and blew their minds. And uh, I never had a single problem the whole time I was there. And, you know, in the end, they uh, offered me a crappy deal and uh, I quit. I just said, I'm not signing this. And uh, it was funny. It was a lot dirtier than that. They originally offered me a terrible deal, and I uh, agreed to it. Uh, but, you know, the whole plan that I had was to, if you're going to fuck me, <laughs> I said, I'm going to fuck you better. <laughs> so I waited till the seventh day into January before I did them. I waited for them to announce their lineup, get all their sponsors, brag about their big, you know, role of, stars and everything else and then i quit and i just said i'm not coming in ever again blow me because you want to play games how do you like this game this is called backdoor reversal in your ass so you know, i'm sure they hate me and i'm sure that they think i'm a horrible person right but what are they you know what's the difference uh i come from that side of the river dude i'm a cool dude from pittsburgh that is like you're gonna do me but it's, it's okay for you to do me but I'm not allowed to play the same game. So I know all their little tricks and all their lies and all their BS, and they wait till seven days before Christmas to make you the offer yeah. and tell you they're busy and all their other bullshit. And so I just said, well, I've learned from the best, all of you. So what I'm going to do is John McEnroe cross-court winner. This is what this is. This is a backhand cross-court winner with an attitude, and I went to sports grid. So – I guess every chance I took, you know, acting like an idiot on Sports Channel America and setting fires and peeing off buildings and breaking all the equipment in the studios and shooting hockey pucks into walls and breaking and smashing windows and, 
and uh, beating up pizza delivery guys and then giving them a hundred dollar tip after we beat their ass. <laughs> Anything we did, crazy. MTG uh, was risky. Uh, I guess the Thrashers was risky. But you know, everything I did on the radio got me on Letterman twice. Uh, I got everybody's attention. The show worked. All I ever did was finish number one, and uh, I made people tons of money. I made myself a lot of money. Uh, I had a blast, and if I'm having fun and enjoying life and making money and taking care of my family and stuff, uh, what else is there, right? Like, so when I went to Sports Grid, uh, when I was at CBS, they wouldn't uh, like I could talk about gambling only in a 15 second commercial at the top of the hour. I could say. Go to ForAllInEvents.com for all my picks. And then 15 seconds, uh, I fart longer than 15 seconds. So that was they made me do 15 seconds. They, I had lawyers up my ass every day for seven years. And so when Sports Grid came around and said, we want you to talk gambling. We want you to talk sports betting. The whole network's about sports betting. We're going to put you on TV. We're going to put you on national radio. And all you can do is gamble all day, sell your picks, do whatever you want, go crazy, blah, blah, blah. And I thought, you know, what the hell? And I, uh, the guy, Lou Mayone, is a you know multi-millionaire. The guy's crazy. Uh, I like him. He's got balls the size of Texas. He's a, a maverick. He makes crazy uh, moves, and they all work. Everything he touches turns to gold. So I went for it, and I, you know, I jumped in head first, and I went on this network that really is you know brand new and young and, and a startup, and it's all. Uh, coming together, and now it's just, you know, blowing up like crazy. It's on everywhere. We're on everything. We're on every OTT service in the world. I'm on everything, Roku, Sling, you name it, I'm on it. I'm on Vizio TV, Samsung TVs, Apple TVs, uh, uh, Plex, Zuma, Stir. I mean, there's nothing, uh, fires, I'm on every one of them. And so uh, the radio network is crazy. It's, uh, you know, it's growing leaps and bounds. I, we got them 1090 in San Diego and L.A. You can hear it in the Canadian Rockies. It's the biggest signal in the history of radio coming out of Tijuana. So it reaches 24 million uh, men in Southern California. That's crazy. I'm on Sports Map. I'm on Sports Byline. Uh, I know big things are happening around the corner with the uh, radio network that are huge. So it's exciting. I'm having fun. And you know, when I was young, dude, I didn't have a wife and kids, right? So I had, you know, none of that. I was just an insane lunatic party animal. And then when I met 34C, I had, you know, <laughs> uh, an incredible hot sizzling affair. Then I had two kids, and uh, they're teenagers now. My son's a couple years from college, and wow. my daughter's in, in seventh, and it's crazy. So I have to take care of people now. It's different. And so... I'm a lot smarter, a lot more older and mature, whatever you want to call it. I handle my business differently. I'm the one that brought Sports Grid 1090. I got the deal for them. I got them the station. They had never heard of it. So I'm doing cool things. I'm still doing a lot of boxing stuff, and it's all kick-ass. So I really don't – you know, the bloodletting and the, and the dead carcasses on the side of the road after my name, the, the path of destruction, the hurricane that I am, the cat five that I've been, I mean, fuck them. I mean, it's just like, whatever. What do you think I'm going to worry about people when I'm getting put in a casket? You know what I mean? Like, when I'm dead, it's over. Or I'm going to sit around and worry what people think of me. I mean, you're the guy that I like the most because you're nuts and you're on edge and you're different and unique and mega talented. And I told you this a million times. You're the coolest radio show that I've heard Thank you. Uh, in sports uh, anywhere. And that's why Howard likes you. I like you because... You know, same reason. I think I can tell talent when I see it. Uh, and I smell it from a mile away in you. So you're like my, I hate to say it, like you're like my offspring. You're like my little brother from another mother. I don't, uh, I like what you do. So, I mean, you didn't get where you are not having big sack. So I don't even want to hear it, what I've done. Like people, people don't like me. Suck my balls. I mean, honestly, like, and here's another one. All yeah. those trade magazines and all those Hall of Fames and all those high, heavy uh, top talkers and top sports, the top 20 and the top, you know, just blow me. I just, like, who reads that besides no one on earth? Yeah. I said that one day. That's the reason they don't ever pick me for anything. Uh, <laughs> one year when I was on Howard Stern, when I, or when I was on Westwood One, I was number two in that talkers thing. And then I said, uh, does it, what is that? Has anyone ever read that? 
I've never heard of it. <laughs> so people people rank me and everything. Whatever rank power rankings, weekly sports power rankings. Uh, Carver High says the best charts and graphs. I don't care if people put me in uh, rankings or halls of fame. What is a radio hall of fame like? Is that like a television hall of fame? Is that like a? It, it ain't Canton. It ain't Cooperstown. You know what I mean? It ain't Toronto, the Hall sure. of Fame in hockey, and no one even gives a fuck about that either. <laughs> like, so calm down with all this, uh, you know, uh, where do you rank among the greatest? Uh, there's only one uh, greatest ever, Howard Stern. Everybody else sucks. <laughs> Scotty, let me ask you about that. When you're talking about your experience with Atlanta, I have found this. I didn't see it as much when I was because I did the hot talk radio. You know, Howard was our morning show. Uh, it was on with, like, uh, the Junkies and Donna Mike and all those shows. Um it was fun and it was crazy and it was the type of radio you're describing. I never lived it like you did, but it it it, it was that essence. Why sports is diversion? Like you are the only guy. One of the reasons why I was drawn to your show immediately is you're talking mixed martial arts. You're talking gambling. Like nobody was touching that stuff five years ago, and now it's mainstream and everybody thinks, oh wow, this is a good idea. Why does sports talk radio and the people that are kind of the gatekeepers, the ones you're talking about, why do they seem to hate? fun so much and they want to make it this buttoned up analytical endeavor it doesn't make any sense it's supposed to be diversion i think there uh everybody thinks one thing that i've always kind of felt like is says that there's a lot of people like i've always been a fan of people that do it right i'm a big believer and i want everyone to have a job like i've always supported my colleagues and peers uh if you look around uh, you know it's the suits and the management and all these uh critics that don't like me and things of this nature, right? That's fine. Have at it. But I care about people like you. I care about people like I think Don and Mike were great. I worked with them, and I worked with uh, some of the best talent ever in the history of radio. I mean, let's face facts. I mean, I could go down the list. It would take me all day, but I've worked with the best. And, I mean, I worked with uh, Adam Carolla and Dr. Drew, and I worked with, uh, you know, O&A, and I worked with Howard Stern, and I worked with Don Imus, and I worked with, uh, Mike and a mad dog, and I mean they won't admit it that I worked with them, but I did. Uh, you know, uh, you know they're they're two, you know they're dorks, okay. And I'm cool <laughs> as fuck. So, and I worked with, uh, you know, the people. Uh, Neil Rogers, the funniest guy I ever worked with, this crazy old Jewish dude in Miami that made fun of everyone, and and you know uh, he'd do an entire show on farting and stuff like that. So, uh, and it goes on and on. Tom Likas, uh, I worked with, like, you know, I worked with Ricky Ragnum before Headbangers Ball. Uh, just the best talent ever. I mean, Hacksaw Hamilton, I worked with all these people at some level, uh, you know, in some capacity or another. Like, even in San Francisco, uh, Ralph Barbieri, Gary Radnich, um, you know, th- these are the biggest names ever in radio. And I worked in Chicago with Man Cow. I- I've done all the best. And so the one thing I've felt is, in like radio, and I'm just saying it, is that everybody thinks they're a genius, right? Everybody's, in sports radio particularly, everybody's uh, so smart, they're never wrong. Uh, they can never, they could never even fathom being wrong about anything. And it's just so painful and just so just soft and lame. Like, it's just like, oh my God, if I had to, if I was right every time about everything in life, uh, stick a knife through my chest. Uh, I like being wrong all the time. Do you know how many times I butcher names on the air? Uh, like the other day, I interviewed some girl named uh, Abrams. I kept calling her. <laughs> so her name was, uh, I got to remember her name. Uh, her name was, uh, what was the girl's name? Uh, Ken, her name was Kendra Abrams. She's a great girl. She works for the Athletic. She covers the Nuggets and whatever. I kept calling her Kendra Wilkinson. Oh, no. And I was, and, but, they, but they always make fun of me, the guys, Mafia and Carver High, because I butcher names, and I call people the wrong names, and I forget things, and I, I make mistakes all the time and chop things up, or, you know, can't remember this guy's name or that guy's name. Can't remember anything and this and that. But I think it makes it um, real, and I think it makes it funny, and I think it makes it natural. And I'm not trying to be smarter than you. I'm not trying to be... You know, is there anything more painful than oh. the guy on the sports talk that thinks he's so smart? Oh, my God. And, and I'm working around. I mean, they're the worst, right? So I think that uh, I wanted to do things. Uh, I've done, well, first of all, no one ever did a show with heavy metal playing for four hours no. on the, underneath the show ever. That was the first thing I ever did. And then as far as the MMA, I've been talking about it since day one. So 
when it was him and cockfighting, I was talking about it. Uh, Dana hired me for two years to do every card. I did every single uh, event in the world. Wherever they went, I went with them and did the show Friday live with all the fighters on my show, and then I'd go to the fight Saturday and then fly home Sunday. And then I made them a, a lot of money promoting their sport. They got so big, they didn't need me to promote them anymore. And they uh, eventually I went back and did TV in New York at SNY. But, um, you know, it's funny because I'd go on SNY and, on Daily News Live or on Wheelhouse, and I'd argue with the, uh, all these writers from the Daily News or with Brandon Tierney and Brian Custer on Wheelhouse. And it was like, do you guys really think you're, like, you know, I was always, like, joking with them. Like, I, they, they'd, I'd say, are you really, you think you're smarter than me or something? Like, your mother. <laughs> And then the guy would want to break my neck. Uh, Brandon would want to break my neck, and he'd threaten me, and I'd be like, whatever, dude. And I like Brandon a lot. I worked with him forever, right? So I know him, and I, I can get under his skin in five seconds. I love the guy. He's great at what he does. But, uh, you know, guys like uh, on the Daily News Live, they, would, they got mad. They got mad. They wanted me off the show because I made fun of them. Like, I, I would joke about them and, and tease them and get under their skin, and, and I could do it so quickly. I could jab them so quickly about their, uh, you know, comments about sports. Like, who gives a fuck about sports? I mean, honestly, like, you know, I want to know who wins, who covers, uh, and I want to watch great games, and I like when my team wins, and I want to, you know, drink beer and, and go crazy and high-five my buddies and, and enjoy a great finish or a great horse race or a great fight or a great hockey game, a double overtime game, whatever. Basketball, I love, but I don't need to be right about it. And so hmm. when I did MMA, I did it. Because uh, I knew it was going to be something huge. I knew sports betting was going to be huge. I did my picks on the air on Westwood One 25 years ago. I was doing picks every every day. And then Fridays I did all the college and pro football, and I did them free at the time. If I would have, you know, asked for money then, if I would have sold them then like I do now, uh, even though they're the cheapest in the history of, of handicapping, because in Vegas they charge thousands, I charge thirty five bucks a month. Hmm. So I don't rip anybody off. I give people their money worth. They make their money back the first night they're a member of my website. Uh, people, you know, they spend more on gas in their gas tank than they do on my picks, and then my picks make them tons of money. You know, I knew sports betting was going to be huge. I just think that everybody was afraid of it. It was taboo. It was like heroin, right? So everyone said, Scott, you can't talk about all this gambling. And then I said, all right, well then I'll talk about weed. And then, uh, and then when they said he can't talk about weed, I said, well, then I'll talk about pussy. And then uh, when I can't talk about pussy, I'll talk about uh, liquor. I'll, I'll start talking about being an alcoholic and just how much booze I can drink. And then uh, I'll talk about road tripping. I'll talk about just breaking rules, everything. Everything I ever did, everything they told me not to do, I just did something to piss off. I actually was on, like, a, a like I guess, like on some kind of death watch. I was... Uh, I was on like a death knoll. Like I, people said I was just asking to be fired. And I got fired a lot, but uh, no one ever forgot me. Yeah. Like the people I've mentioned, like some of these bosses, I mean, all you have to do is mention my name and their uh, blood pressure goes through the roof. I mean, they just <laughs> absolutely snap. I know, I know about five guys that you can mention my name and it'll ruin their day as sure as the sun comes up. So I kind of like having that ability to grade on people that uh, frankly don't like me. But I think... Radio's boring as shit. So, I mean, they've ruined it with all these uh, stations that are so lame and yeah. so the music's so repetitive and they just turn out the same thing every day, every week, and they just keep playing the same songs and they got rid of all the DJs and they the DJs are what made it cool. Can you imagine, uh, like, I think, um, you know, when you think back to Warner Wolf, guys like that that did sports talk, can you imagine, or um, Wolfman Jack, Guys that uh, that set the bar, you know, Wolfman Jack's turning in his grave that they don't have DJs anymore. Like satellite radio, they got about three DJs, yeah. and the rest of it's all just uh, on a you know computer, just spinning music, the same two hundred songs over and over, and they just scramble them, and it's just ruined everything. I mean, they've gotten rid of employees, they've gotten rid of bodies, they've gotten rid of DJs, they've gotten rid of everything. They're, they don't pay anybody, and so. I'm for jobs. I'm for uh, talent. I'm for funny people. I'm for DJs. I'm for the morning show not being a pussy morning show, uh, you know, with uh, everybody sitting around laughing. <laughs> You're so funny. Did you watch the Emmys last night, man? <laughs> I just can't take it. I want to kill myself. It's so bad. Scotty, it's so awful. You know it sucks, Chad. You know uh -huh. it sucks. 
And you know what? It's hard to say it because you work for those people. Sure. So you're scared to death of them. Yes, that's true. But if, I, what I've noticed, noticed also, Scotty, is that the, the one thing that separates radio from podcasts is, this, besides the fact that it's in your car still, is is the talent, what you're talking about. It's the personalities that draw people, the knowledge that a music disc jockey brings, the knowledge that a morning show host brings, the opinions or the, the comedy. What, what they're doing is they're just turning it into a playlist. Like they're turning it into something you can already get on your phone and negating what brings people still to their table in the first place. I don't understand that mindset. Do you remember, uh, obviously, you know Eddie Trunk, right? Sure, so of course. Eddie Trunk is the greatest rock and roll DJ ever in the history of the medium, bar none. And I'm good friends with him. We've been buddies forever, right? And he's been on my show a bunch of times. There's no one that knows rock and roll more than Eddie. And the way he brings all those musicians on his show and... Um, you know, talks about albums and concerts and tours and the history of music. No one knows it better. Uh, there's no DJ that I've ever heard that can even hold his dick. And he is <laughs> phenomenal. They have to have guys like that for this uh, business to survive and for it to uh, thrive and move forward. Uh, like, uh, you know, I try, as you know, I've had a ton of rock stars on my show. Yeah. And I've had a ton of actors on my show, actresses, whatever. I love um, people that are talented and gifted and that are uh, have the ability to perform, whether it's music or acting. I love uh, television. I love movies. I love being in movies. I love being on TV shows. I love taping CSI Miami. I like doing Battle Dome with Steve Albert. I like, um, you know, doing MTV. I like uh, do, doing Big Fan and Red Belt, the movies I did with David Mamet, and then I did the guy that wrote The Wrestler. Uh, he did Big Fan, and I worked with, you know, uh, Rappaport and Patton Oswalt. These, these people, I love having them on my show because uh, I think entertainment makes the world go round. It, it's funny. They want, you know, television and movies to constantly – uh, break new ground and try new things and, and evolve and get bigger and better and, and crazier and wilder and, and, and the things that they do in Hollywood, the way they shoot movies, uh, why can't uh, they let radio be that way? You know, and the podcast thing, I'll tell you, the, the podcast thing for me, and I'm just being honest, I mean, I'm not here to be a bitch. Uh, if there's 50 million podcasts and I, I just, I can't take it. Yeah. I just, I, and I won't take it. I just refuse to uh, fall into that. Like, can you imagine if you went on a, like, even uh, the ones, like, I, they podcast my radio show, right? But I had done Pharrell and the Bats on Westwood One. And I, I did, uh, when I first started at Sports Grid, I did uh, Pharrell and the Bats as a podcast for like an hour every day. And then it became the, uh, the radio show that they're syndicating now. And then they just podcast that out every single day on iHeart Podcasts and on everything else. And uh, I got to tell you, I could give a rat's ass about it. Uh, it's the dumbest thing ever. And the fact that I have to like lay it down or like Mafia be lays it down, and then I have to, I have to, you know, send it out, tweet it out, LinkedIn out, uh, Facebook it out, uh, Instagram it out. And just every day I have to copy it and paste on all those things, and it takes me like a half hour to do it. And I want to kill myself because I just don't care about it. I think there's too many of them, and uh, I know there's millions of them and everything, and I just wouldn't know which yeah. ones are great because I don't give a fuck. Yeah. Uh, I would listen to you always, and I would listen to your radio show always. I have listened to your radio show, but i got to be honest with you. Um, I don't listen to radio shows ever anymore because they suck so bad, and I listen to people that are great like you, and, I mean, you guys, there's there's guys like, I know the junkies are great at what they do. There's, there's sports guys all over. I like Domino in Atlanta. He's a great dude. He's on my show all the time. I put on guys from Sirius XM all the time, like uh, Brian Geltziler. I like him when he talks hoops. And he's NBA radio. And I have guys on that do radio shows uh, that I like. But I don't know about you. I don't sit around listening to the radio because I do it every right. day of my life. I've done it for 35 years every single day, basically, for, you know, Monday through Friday for my whole life. I'm old now. I'm 55. I started when I was 18 doing the Bob Knight show in Bloomington, Indiana. I've never stopped. So for me, uh, like, I be, I'm just being straight up. I, I watch TV. You know, I like watching 
Netflix and Hulu and, and Prime, and I like watching movies, and I like going to movies, and I like, I you know, you've heard the stories. I play basketball four or five days a week. Every day of my life, I play basketball. I train, I box, I kickbox. I do anything but sit around listening to the radio because uh, there's so many, in my opinion, that sound the same that I want to stick a nine block in my mouth. And I'm not saying that anyone's bad. I'm not saying that people suck. I'm just saying I can't take it because it's changed so much. Like sure. the thing I'll tell you about Howard is Howard's the greatest show ever. And he's the greatest talent ever that I've ever been around. The greatest person I've ever worked for or worked with or been around him and Neil Rogers are my two favorite all time. Right. And so I don't listen to Howard ever. Not one time, not one minute ever since the day I left there because I, I want to jump off a Niagara Falls because I miss it. I miss working with him. And I, it, mean, it means a lot to me, our friendship. And, and the years I spent there were so uh, wonderful and so amazing and so incredible for me. And it was so exotic to do a, a no-rules, uncensored, raw show. It was the best show I ever did. And I knew they were going to take it away from me. And I'm certain I was right because as soon as I left, they changed it. They brought in that Marcy chick. She changed the whole thing. They got rid of all yeah. those one-hour shows, and it's all about Howard. And I knew it was coming because I'm smart enough to smell it, right? But uh, ever since then, I've done pussy radio. I mean, the show I'm doing now is uh, not what I prefer. I prefer rock and roll and music and, and being who I am. And they won't even let me do it because of ass cap rules and everything else and yeah. all this other nonsense. I like doing the show, but I don't even take calls anymore, Chad. I, I don't even take calls. I used to do a show driven with fans, and I don't do that anymore. I talk about games betting, what's happening in the game, what's happening in every sport, what's happening in the moment, who's covering, what the number is, what the in-game line is, what the in-game line's changing to. I don't have time to take calls, so I'm constantly evolving, but it's not like something that I, uh, when I, when I do it as much as I've done it, I can't sit around and, and listen to any more of it anywhere else. You know what I mean? Like, sure. you'll never catch me listening to a podcast. I was doing podcasts when I did it, when I first started doing podcasts for them. I did a podcast on my back porch with um, two different uh, doctors. One of them was my rectal doctor uh, <laughs> who did, he's done uh, like eight ass operations on my ass fistulas because Howard and I both had ass fissures, right? And so I had, I have had like eight ass surgeries. So I did an entire show about my bleeding rectum and that was awesome. And then I did a show with another doctor uh, who um, he, he actually uh, operated and took a beer bottle out of a guy's rectum. And I thought that was a great show too. Oh uh, any God. show that I can do that's fun. I did one with my Catholic priest who uh, drinks and smokes cigarettes on my back deck with my wife. 34C, he'll drink a bottle of JMO with you from Wales. Like uh, anything I can do that's different or unique or funny or weird or demented or sick or uh, compulsive or raw nuts, uh, uh, you know, even illegal, anything illegal. I've done entire shows on weed strains. I mean, I'll do anything anymore. What's left to do, Chad? I mean... I've done everything else. What's left for me? We sit around listening to the fucking podcast all day. I mean, come on, dude. I'd rather be in the Caribbean with a, a banana hammock on and a doobie in my mouth trying to get laid and, and trying to get it up still at my age. You know, when I'm 60, 65, will I even be able to get a boner? So I'm 55 now. I'm on a time constraint here. It's like when they replay games late night on ESPN, we're on time constraints, so we're moving forward in the action. I got about 10 years left of stiff wood. I got to take advantage <laughs> of it while I can. Got to chop wood to burn the pun. Scotty, you, you talked about Howard. Um, I got, I, I'm like you. I can tell you have an enormous amount of respect with the guy and uh, working on his stations. That to me, you were around for the NEW days and you were around for the beginning of Howard on serious days, two of the most important times, I think, in all of talk radio. But I respect Howard and his decision to take the show where it is now. He can do whatever he wants. I think uh, evolving is something that is, um, you know, we should all try to do. But I also, I realize that show isn't for me anymore, and I, I don't listen to it anymore either. I don't, I don't mean any disrespect from that, but when he interviews Leah Dunham for an hour, nine, an hour and a half, I'm just like, well, I don't, this is not radio that's done for me. I don't know if you call it maturation. It certainly is an evolution 
for him. You were there when it was, I think, as good as it gets, when Artie is there and you got Bubba and you and that whole lineup and all right. those one-hour shows. I mean, it was two right. stations of stuff with insanity going on all the time. What do you think about how much, the best that's ever done it, I agree with you, how much he's changed over the years? Well, it's a great question. I, look, uh, I, 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 I'd be remiss if I didn't mention Bubba. You mentioned him. I love Bubba, and he's one of the funniest dudes I've ever met in my life. And, I mean, this dude is completely demented. I mean, <laughs> he is – this guy is the most fun to be around of any – I think any human being I've ever been around. I went to his wedding with Howard and everybody and, you know, the whole deal, whole Kogan, everything. It was all – it was crazy. Uh, I was at Howard's wedding. I was sitting at a table with Billy Joel and Barbara Walters and uh, Donald Trump, right? And I'm like, uh, it, this is crazy, right? I'm sitting there and like, uh, so, but I will say this, like, he's become, uh, you know, what people say now is that he's become the exact person that he used to make fun of, right? That he he used to uh, abuse these uh actors and actresses and people in Hollywood, he'd make fun of them and, uh, and torture them and drive them nuts and, uh, you know, just berate them and ride them like a horse and just keep driving them and, and to the edge, right, and making them just jump off the cliff. And he'd have funerals for people and everything else back in the day when he was, you know, just so hardcore and kind of uh, ruthless and mean and funny at the same time. And then he became, you're right, he evolved into this, uh, A-list celebrity himself and is, uh, without a doubt, the greatest interviewer ever in radio. I think there's been better interviewers in the history of the world. Uh, I, you know, I think David Letterman is the best I've ever uh, seen uh, it, it, with in terms of humor and talent and the ability to uh, get people to do things and say things and, you know, draw it out of them, right? But there's others. There's certainly others that are that are gifted at it and great at it. But no one like uh, Howard and David for me. Uh, those are two people that I look up to so much. But I think that um, unlike you, and that I can't. Well, I, I told you why I can't listen. But sure. I, it's not because I can't listen to or do an interview. I will say uh, the only time I ever listened was when my wife uh, actually uh, taped the Metallica interview yeah. from like a month or two ago yeah. because. I'm friends with them, right? So when I heard them on, I've seen them live 30 times. They hired me to do Acoustica, the album. I'm the voice on the album, uh, taking the phone calls from people all over the world. And I got to work with them and be around them and hang out with them in San Francisco and everything. And uh, so when they were on, it, it mattered to me, and I cared. And I loved listening to him talk to him. But uh, he didn't know him like I knew him, right? And so he was asking him questions that, uh, I wouldn't have asked him because I guess I had the advantage of knowing him a little bit better. And he didn't know how they act and tour. and He didn't know where they uh, had their studios in Sausalito. He thought they were in L.A. And so um, he's the best interviewer I've ever heard in radio, right, like on radio, bar none. But he does all these celebrities that he used to make fun of. Now he's best friends with all of them. He's uh, kind of, you know, without a doubt, like no one can argue, he's the Hampton set now, right? And People say that, and that's fair enough. You know, Howard's like, I think, 12 years older than me, something like that. He has every right to live his life with Beth. I love Beth. Uh, I love Howard. And so they can live in Palm Beach in their mansion or live in the Hamptons in their mansion or live in the Upper West Side in his fat crib. Whatever he does, I'm, I'm all for it. But I can see why you don't listen um, because, you know, the fact is that, like, even he knows how talented you are because he said so. And then I think you're busy, in my view, uh, being your own entity. I think you've become a special talent and broadcaster in your own right, and you don't have time to, frankly, like I said, worry about other people. Like hmm. you have, I remember when you were doing it with our uh, with our boy from uh, Penn State uh, back in the day. Oh, Lavar, yeah, Lavar, yeah, Lavar. When you were doing shows with Arrington, I, you know, I remember those days. You've evolved from that, like, into a way I don't even – maybe you don't even see it yourself because you're too cool. But, <laughs> like, I see, you, I, I see your evolution. I see your lifestyle, your, your humor, your uh, full of life, your, your buzz. you got the whole thing going. So I think what you've done is just kind of – for me, this is just me. I could be tripping and I could be wrong. But I think you've, uh, you know, become so great at what you're doing, you got no time to worry about other people or other shows or other talents or anything. 
I think you care about people and you want people to do well and keep their jobs. That's what I've yeah, always been about. Like, absolutely. I support every kid that ever worked for me. Like, you understand, like, Rasan does the wrap-up show. Uh, he's an incredible talent, and I found him. I'm the one that made him. I'm the one that put him on the air. He was an intern. They never gave him a penny. Uh, Sirius never paid him one penny when he worked uh, there. For the two years he worked for me, um, I'd get him drunk every day. Uh, you know, I, he, I had him at my house a million times. Uh, we played ball a lot. Uh, I cared about his girlfriend, Ange. I cared about, you know, the wife now. And I cared about him when he had his daughter. Uh, and when he got the job, I couldn't have been happier because I knew he had talent. It was the same thing with Iron Sheik. Uh, Howard didn't know Iron Sheik. I did. Uh, I brought Iron Sheik to that network. And then he took him to another level, right? I brought it out of him, and then Howard took him to another level. And I think that, uh, you know, uh, it, it just kind of happens. I want everyone. I want Mafia to do well. Carver High, they both started doing their own shows now on Sports Grid. They're doing uh, in-game live shows and weekend shows and uh, betting shows and MMA shows and hockey shows. And they're still my producers, but I've always wanted them to become uh, talent and become happy uh, getting a chance to do TV and radio and do their own shows and fill in for me, do holidays, do weekends, do TV, do everything, do radio. And they're evolving, and Shep's the same way. Shep was nobody, was nothing. Now he's doing all kinds of stuff at NBA Radio, at Sirius, at CBS Sports Radio. He does his own uh, basketball podcast now. Everyone there, Lou Pellegrino, he's at running Westwood One's podcast. Max Krasny became the president of Westwood One. Then he went to work with Altitude and CBS, and now he's back at Westwood One. Max was a bartender when I hired him. Uh, Darren Sand, DC Cab, he was uh, a producer at Canviar. Now he's, you know, run the Angels and Lakers uh, for, you know, 20 years. Uh, he's become huge. Brett Abbott was huge at, and still is at Westwood One. Anderson Cowan became a movie director. He was like a junkie when I hired him. Uh, he was a complete loser <laughs> junkie with tattoos all over his body and 15 earrings and 25 rings on his fingers and 700 wristbands and a, a total, you know, pot surfer freak like Skid Row looking dude. And, I, and now he, and now he's got a feature films on Prime and on uh, the big screen in Hollywood. I want everyone. I want you to be great. I want everyone I've ever known that's ever touched me in my career to be great. I want everyone to be successful, and even people that hate me, uh, I want them to be successful and have jobs and families and do well. The last thing I want to see is people losing their jobs and careers because of things like radios going broke, radio executives are making bad decisions, radio programmers suck and they make bad decisions, or COVID brings everybody to their knees, things like that. I want radio to survive. I actually think I've been watching it. You know, it's changed so much. It's not the same as it ever was. Uh, everybody's, like, turned to podcasts. Instead of focusing on what's wrong with radio oh, yeah. and how do we save radio from dying, because I think it's kind of slowly, no one will admit it, but I think it's been slowly dying. I think you're probably right, um, and I, I know you got to. This we we cut into your your reload time here as you're between gigs, Scotty. So I'll, I'll ask you one more, and I appreciate the time. It's at Scott Frell. Follow him on Twitter. You, you mentioned the current climate we're in. One of the things I've always admired about what you do is no matter how much pearl clutching there is going on, you walk the line. You push the limits. You still make <laughs> jokes. You like I, you're attempting to be funny and then having people get mad at you about it. I've never understood it, and you've never been scared of it. But I got to be honest. Every day I crack the microphone, I'm like, am I going to try to be funny today? Somebody takes it the wrong way, and then I'm out of my ass. I mean, it's something that just hovers over all of us. How much more difficult do you think that makes the job of trying to be funny and entertain on the radio when there's a bunch of unfunny people out there right now with letterhead just waiting to take everyone down? Yeah, it's scary, right? Um, you know, I feel bad when I see that happen to people. I think, you know, Tony Bruno's a good friend of mine. I think he's a brilliant uh, talent, and he's just done huge things in his career on radio and you know, people tried to paint him a racist in five minutes, and he's he's anything but. And I think that there's evil people out there that want to ruin people's lives, and they have nothing better to do than to try to destroy people and tear people down. And I think people that do that are uh, pathetic. I've had it happen to me my whole career, Chad. I've had lawyers. Uh, this lawyer in South Florida went after Neil Rogers and I every single day 
sued me 30 times, uh, came, tried to destroy me, my family, every single day, his entire life, Mr. was to ruin me. And uh, he swung and missed, and he's a bitch. And I don't, and I told him, uh, you know, I'm pretty crazy. I'm like, come down here, I, you know where we are, and I'll just beat your ass. How does that sound? We'll just do that instead of all this other rhetoric. Why don't we just come down here and settle this, and I'll just show you how crazy I am. And then, uh, but there's people now that sit and try to uh, ruin people's careers, and everything you say now uh, is taken the wrong way. Uh, I'm scared to death like you to talk uh, race, religion, politics. Um, I think mean, it's so easy to make fun of the tool in the White House. Uh, I don't care what anybody thinks of him. Uh, that guy's evil, and I don't. And I worked for him. I worked for him in MMA when he did the Affliction uh, MMA card in Anaheim. He paid me a ton of money. I was always friends with him and his son uh, Donald Jr. And I knew his wife uh, Melania, and I knew them all. And I've been around him. I've been in the Trump Tower. I worked with the Affliction, so their their headquarters were there. And I've known them all, but I don't know. He just changed when he went. Uh, obviously, anyone would change if they became the president. I don't get into politics uh, in D.C. I don't get into politics on the radio, uh, Democrat, Republican, all that stuff. I think they're all a bunch of uh, morons and liars and thieves. So it's easy for me to make fun of them. But if you go there every day, you'll, you'll get fired. If you do a religion, someone will uh, get you fired. If you, because there's holy wars over religion. I mean, it, there's people blowing people up over it. So, uh, and then um, race is just automatic. Uh, that's an automatic uh, death knoll. That's a, you're walking the plank uh, if you go there. But, you know, um, I, I play ball so much in the hood. I'm, I'm with, uh, playing with some of the greatest brothers I know are uh, black uh, that I play ball with, and I love them, and I have no problem with anybody. Uh, but if you say the wrong thing nowadays, like Tony said something, people I think took it the wrong way, and, and then in five minutes he was fired. I like get that's insanity. And then I've seen everyone. I've been, listen, I've been getting fired for stuff I'd never even said. I've been getting fired for other people. I told you about ONA. I got fired for that. I had nothing to do with it, uh, the, the sex in the St. Patrick's Cathedral. Uh, I supported it wholly, though. Uh, but I got to tell you, um, everything they ever did, the crazy stuff they did, putting people in barrels and beating them with wiffle ball bats and all this other stuff, humiliation on the radio is funny. It is. Um, obviously, people can't take jokes anymore, dude. Uh, people are so offended by everything. You know what? It's the pussification of this country, and it's it's really bad. Like I was saying today, when they change that Supreme Court, they're going to, uh, before long, uh, when they abolish abortion and everything else, they're going to have, if we're going to be, uh, we're basically uh, communism. I mean, we're, we're not far from it. When they, They're going to change all the rules. You're not allowed to say this. You're not allowed to do that. You can't go here. You can't go there. you got to wear a mask. You gotta do this, you gotta do that, you can't get an abortion, you can't, uh, you're not allowed to talk about it. the Catholics say the Jews, the Jews hate the uh, black and white, the blacks hate the white, the whites hate the black, the left, right, middle, uh, liberal. Oh my God, uh, I just want to die. Like, it's not even worth it. So, what I do is, um, I bet on sports. Yeah. And I try to get laid. Yeah. And I try to eat everything I see. Like, so. I play basketball so much that I, I'm a hungry motherfucker, so I just want to eat everything. I'm on a seafood diet. Everything I see, Chad, I eat. <laughs> I'll eat anything. Brisket, barbecue, fish, steaks, burgers, tacos, uh, Doritos by the bag. When I go to that store, I buy 15 bags of Doritos. I do not <laughs> fuck around. I don't get, like, cheese. I get everything they make. I eat uh, salsa, guacamole. I'll eat uh, uh, 50 to 100 popsicles a week, ice cream. Are you kidding me? I have sex at Dairy Queen. They know me by name in there. I'll eat blizzards. I'll eat cones. I'll eat caramel. Sunday filled with like 80 gallons of caramel. I'll drink caramel until I have a... I drank so much fucking caramel, I became a... Uh, what do they call it? Uh, diabetes. I'm pre-diabetic. They told me I was going to die. So I stopped uh, drinking soda. I gave them something back. I don't drink soda. I quit drinking booze when I had my son like 15 years ago. That sucks. I have to say the worst thing that's happened in my life, uh, in my entire life, is not I've lost everyone. My parents are dead, everything else. Everyone I love is dead. Uh, but I have uh, the only thing I miss is drinking. I was really good at it, Chad. I drank like a champion, like a British sailor. I was one of the greatest drinkers ever. I could drink six Guinness and five shots of Patron and still do the show at Howard every night, straight up, no questions asked. And everyone knew it. 
I would drag my producers up the street hammered, like completely shit-faced to do it. And our bosses said, you're way better when you're drunk and high. Keep doing it. <laughs> so the show was way funnier when we were lit. And then when I quit drinking, I got to tell you, man, I am just such a bitch now. I mean, it is awful. I drink Pellegrino water. And I mean, I, my wife said, you got to stop with all the coffee. I drank 100 cups of coffee a day like a man. I go to dinner, I drink three double espressos. Most people have two. They're sweating like they did an eight ball. I drink six espressos, and I'm ready to fuck. <laughs> I drink hundred cu- cups of coffee a day like a man. I think John Wayne on the way to the set, he would have a hundred cups of coffee before he went out there. I'm telling you, dude. Like, so now I'm such a, I, I'm such a bitch. I don't drink. I, I just don't even do anything. Like, uh, thank God for reefer. I mean, honestly, it's the only thing that stood the test of time in my life. People are like, "Why do you like California?" I'm like, "Weed maps." <laughs> I mean, dude, I'm still cool. I just am old, and it sucks. I got less hair. I got less everything. I used to have tons of hair. Now I do like I do a full clean. You see me on TV? I'll go. I got cleaned up today, Cobra High. I got cleaned up. That's a nice way of saying my days of having any hair are numbered. Like when I saw I had like an area of concern on the back of my head. Uh, Rasan spotted it at Howard Stern, and the day I saw I was losing hair on the top because I had been wearing headsets for 25 years. I honestly, I went into fucking therapy. I was ready to fucking, I started doing the Pat Riley. I slicked my hair back to cover the bald spot. I started wearing hats. I started pouring minoxidil on my head. I did anything to, to it was, that was the worst day of my life. So when I go bald, I'm going to be such a pussy. Like, it's just going to be the worst. I'm going to shave it all. I think I'm going to get a tattoo on the top of my head. Yeah. And I think I'm, I'm going to end up in San Quentin uh, lifting weights in the yard. Bam Bam Bigelow style, my friend, is you could do a lot worse. Uh, check out PharrellOnTheBench.com, PharrellOnTheBench.com for all his picks and Pharrell Coast to Coast uh, week at, uh, weekday afternoons on Sports Grid. You can go to at Sports Grid on Twitter to find more information. Scotty, you are the best in the business. I think I asked you four questions. We filled an entire hour. Can't thank you enough for doing this, buddy. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's cool. Get the uh, Sports Grid app, and you can watch the, the show from 4 to 6 on your phone. And the Sports Grid radio app carries the radio show and the TV show, and it's like 24-7. People say, where are you on? Because, you know, it's on all these OTT, so people say, I don't see you on TV. I'm like, suck a dick. Uh, just get the app, okay? Get the app, and you can watch it on your fucking phone in your car when you're playing with yourself. It's really cool. The apps work great. You click, uh, you hit a button. It's like a, it's like the uh, vagina. You just hit that thing, and boom, you're in. And then you watch it. Everybody's happy. Get that, you know, a little. You gotta hit that button right there and get a little Jimmy going, and then you're good to go. Good to go. Sportsgrid.com for details. The great Scott Frell, everybody. Scotty, thank you so much, bud. All right, Mister Dukes. I love you, bro. Peace out. The great. Scott Farrell, my God, I'm going to go have a cigarette and a shower. Uh, thank you to him. Go check him out, uh, at Scott Farrell on Twitter. And, uh, yeah, just Google him. Watch his show. He's uh, he's the best. I, I listen to that guy when my life was as bad as it possibly could be. I would get home from Home Depot. I'd listen to two, the last two hours of The Junkies and four hours of Scott Farrell while I was playing my Nintendo 64 or my PlayStation 1 watching uh, WCW Monday Night Nitro. My God.